Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on vibrations and waves. The topic of this video is pendulum motion, and we want to know how does the force, acceleration, velocity, position, kinetic and potential energy change over the course of a pendulum's path, and what factors affect the period of a pendulum. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. You have likely seen a pendulum in motion. A pendulum consists of a relatively massive object attached to a string. We refer to that massive object as the bob. The opposite end of the string is attached to some sort of support at the point of attachment. We call that the pivot position. The pendulum swings back and forth about a fixed position along a circular arc. The fixed position is known as the resting position. It's the position that the bob and the string would assume when it's not vibrating whatsoever. The string is typically vertical at the resting position. A pendulum's motion is an example of periodic motion because it exhibits two characteristics. First of all, it's repeating. It occurs over and over again, cycle after cycle. And second of all, it's regular. The time it takes to complete a single cycle, known as the period, is the same amount of time, one consecutive cycle after another. As a pendulum bob vibrates back and forth along its circular arc, there are two dominant forces that act upon it. First, the force of gravity, which we'll label as f grab, and second, the tension force that comes from the string interacting with the pendulum bob. We'll label that force f tension. The force of gravity has a constant magnitude and a constant direction. The magnitude is found by taking the mass of the bob and multiplying by 9.8 newtons per kilogram. The direction of the force of gravity is always directed down Onwards. The tension force has a changing magnitude or value and a changing direction. While the direction of the tension force is changing, the rule is that it's always directed upwards along the string towards the pivot point. We're going to draw free body diagrams for these five positions along the circular arc of a pendulum bob. That is, from the dot in the middle of the bob, we're going to draw two arrows, one for each of the forces. We're going to put them in the proper direction, label them according to type, and size them relatively accurately. We'll begin with the force of gravity. That's the easy one. Always down, always the same size. And there you see the force of gravity for the five positions. The tension force is a little trickier. We're always going to draw it upwards along the string towards the pivot point. We'll start at the middle position. There we draw the tension force straight upwards. You'll notice it's a little larger than the force of gravity. We'll talk about the relative size of tension in a later slide. Now we'll do the two extreme positions, extreme left and extreme right. Here's the two, those two positions. You'll notice again the tension force goes along the string directed upwards towards the pivot point. I label it F tension. The size here is again a little bit different than it was in the middle. We'll talk more about that later. Finally, here's the last two positions for the free body diagram for a pendulum bob. Let's talk about the acceleration and net force experienced by the pendulum bob as it does a, its back and forth from A to B to C and then back from C to B to A for a complete cycle. When we think about acceleration and net force, we have to think about Newton's laws. And there's two things that we know from Newton's laws about net force and acceleration. First, a net force causes an acceleration and an acceleration requires a net force. The second thing we know is that the direction of the net force and acceleration vectors are always in the same direction. Now the pendulum bob is moving along a circular arc and we know from circular motion principles that a movement along a circular path requires an inward force or centripetal force. That is a force towards the center of the circle along which the pendulum bob is moving. In the center of that circle is the pivot point. So as a pendulum bob moves along its circular path, there's a component of net force directed towards the pivot point. But that motion along the circular arc is not a constant speed motion. There's a change in speed as it moves from A to B. It's actually speeding up along that part of its cycle. And because it's speeding up, there must be some sort of component of force to cause such an acceleration. That component of force would be directed towards B to speed the bob up as it moves from A to B. Then the bob continues from B to, a, to, to C. And along that part of its cycle, 
it's slowing down. Because it's slowing down, there must be a net force against its motion to cause such a slowing down type acceleration. Again, that net force would be directed back towards location B, the resting position. Now the bob goes from location C back to B, and as it does, that's a speeding up motion that requires a component of net force directed back towards B. Finally, the bob moves past B back to A to complete its cycle, and along that part of its path, it's slowing down, which would require a component of net force against its motion, again, directed backwards towards location P. So there's two big ideas on this slide that you have to capture. First, an, a pendulum bob moving along its circular arc experiences a component of net force that is centripetal, directed towards the pivot point. And second, it experiences a component of net force that's tangential to the circular, circular path, directed always towards location B, no matter what part of the path the pendulum bob's moving along. Now we're going to conduct a complete force analysis in which we show free body diagrams and show how, from those free body diagrams, we can get a component of net force directed centripetal to the circular path, upwards towards the pivot point, as long as it's moving along that path. And also, how we can get a component of net force directed back towards the resting position to cause the pendulum bob to speed up or slow down as it moves towards or away from the resting position. So here's the first position we're going to do, and it's, a, it's the extreme left position. This is unique because there's only two places along the arc in which the pendulum bob is momentarily not moving. It's the one on the far extreme left and the other on the far extreme right. At this position, there's two forces, again, tension force and there's gravity force. And what we're going to do is choose a coordinate axis system in which one of the coordinate axes is directed towards the pivot point, centripetal to the circle, and the other is directed perpendicular to that or tangent to the, to the circular path. So to do that, I'm going to resolve gravity into the two components. I draw a parallelogram with the force of gravity as the diagonal, and I break the force of gravity up into two components. One one of them is directed perpendicular to the path, that's the centripetal component, and the other one is tangent to the path. Now as I mentioned, this is the extreme left position and unique in that at this moment in time, the velocity is zero, and because it is, the centripetal force is unnecessary. mv squared divided by r, the equation for centripetal force at this point, is actually zero. So at this unique location, the perpendicular component of gravity balances the tension force. But it's at this point that the pendulum bob's in the process of speeding up towards the resting position. So we need a tangential net force at this point, and that tangential net force uh, is, is from the tangential component of gravity, and it's the restoring force that restores the pendulum bob back to the resting position, speeding it up along the way. Now there's multiple locations for which we can draw free body diagrams. For all the other locations, we're not going to have that case of the velocity is zero. We'll take this this instance maybe halfway back towards the resting position. Two forces, there's gravity down, tension up. We're going to take the gravity force and resolve it into its two components. So we draw a parallelogram around the gravity force with one of the sides of that parallelogram tangential to the circle and the other one perpendicular to the tangent line and directed up towards the pivot point. We break gravity up into its two components. There you see it. And because we have a velocity at this point, because the pendulum bob's moving, there must be be that centripetal force. So the tension force is greater than the perpendicular component of gravity at this position and many other positions between the extreme left and the central point. Now we have a tangential component of force as well to speed this object up as it moves towards the resting position. That tangential component of gravity is the net force that's tangent to the circle, restoring the pendulum back to the resting position, speeding it up in its path from the extreme left to the center point. Finally, we do this case in which we're at the resting position. Now there is no component of gravity tangent to the circle, nor does there need to be one at this point, because the pendulum bob's in the process of changing from the speeding up to the slowing down, and it's at this point that the only component of net force that we need is the component that's directed upwards towards the pivot point. So you'll notice here that the tension force is greater than the perpendicular component of gravity to cause that centripetal acceleration, and we also have no restoring force, no component of force in gravity that's directed tangent to the circle.
Now let's talk about how the position of the pendulum bob varies with respect to time as the bob moves along its circular arc. In order to do this, we need to pick a reference frame, and we do by saying that location B, the resting position, is the zero position of the bob, and any movement of the bob to the right of this position would be in the positive direction, counterclockwise from B, and any movement to the left of this position would be in the negative direction, that is clockwise from B towards C. So if we look at how that position position varies with respect to time, and we showed it as a graph, it would look something like this. It's sinusoidal in nature, where the position is a function of the sine of the time. Now what we'd like to do is connect points on the graph with points on the circular arc of this pendulum's path. We're going to begin with the first point on the graph, which is the zero position, which must be location B according to our reference frame. Now as it moves from B to the highest most positive position, what it's doing on the graph is moving from B to C, which is from the middle to the extreme right position. Once it gets to the extreme right position, it's going to move back towards B with a zero position, and that would look like this on the graph from C to B. Once it's at B, it's going to move over to location A, which is actually in the negative direction, so we'll start to get negative position values when we get to A. And finally, once it reaches A, it will complete its cycle by moving back to location B, and as it does, it's completed one cycle of vibration. Now this is going to happen over and over again, according to anything that's in periodic motion, it will be repeating and it will be regular. And so the next cycle will be a movement from B to C, back to B, back to A, and then back to B, and that would look like this on the position time graph. Now these cycles repeat over and over again, and this is what we would begin to see if we connected strategic points on the position time graph to strategic points on the path of the pendulum bob along its circular arc. If we were to summarize all this, we would say something like this. Now, let's look a little bit more detail because as the pendulum bob moves from B away from the resting position to C, it's going to be slowing down during that pathway. And as it moves from C back to B towards the resting position, the restoring force will cause it to speed up. Once at B, it moves over to A, away from the resting position, so it's going to be slowing down. And finally, as it moves back towards the resting position from A to B, it will be speeding up. We're going to use this information about slowing down and speeding up to connect a position time graph to a velocity time graph. When you comprehend the position time graph we just discussed, it's easy to understand how this position time graph translates into the velocity time graph. We're going to use the same reference frame we just used in order to explain the connection. Let's take the pendulum bob starting at time zero, where the position was zero, and it moves from B to C, the rightmost position along the circular arc. As it does, it's moving in the positive direction, so it has a positive velocity, and it's moving from the largest velocity at location B to the slowest velocity at the zero velocity at location C. So on the velocity time graph, I'm going to plot positive velocity values that start at a very large velocity and end up at zero velocity, it looks like this. Now once at location C, the pendulum bob returns to location B, and as it does, it's going to be speeding up and getting bigger and bigger velocities, but because it's moving in the negative direction from C to B, those velocities are going to be negative velocities. So I show this on the velocity time graph. Negative velocities from zero to a large negative velocity, which is what we have when we're at location B. Once at location B, the pendulum bob moves to location A. That's a movement in the negative direction, so once more we have negative velocities, and that's a movement from a very large negative velocity to a velocity of, of V equals zero. So on the velocity time graph, that movement from B to C looks something like this. Now once at C, it returns back to B, and that's going to be a speeding up movement as the, as the pendulum bob's moving in the positive direction, so now positive velocities will be plotted from from location A to location B, and they get larger and larger positive velocities because finally at location B, that's the fastest that the object moves. So it looks something like this. Now this movement from B to C to B to A back to B happens cycle after cycle after cycle, so we would show points that look something like this. 
Now let's conduct an energy analysis on the pendulum bob. Once more, we're going to assume air resistance is negligible, and if we do ignore the effects of damping, we can say that the only force doing work upon the pendulum bob is the force of gravity. The tension force acts perpendicular to the direction of motion at all points along the circular arc, and as such, does not do work upon the pendulum bob. Gravity is a conservative style force, and because it does, the total mechanical energy of the pendulum bob remains constant as it goes back and forth along its circular arc. Now to understand that, we have to understand that kinetic energy depends upon speed and potential energy depends upon height. So if the total of these two forms of energy remains constant, as the kinetic energy goes down, the potential energy should go up, and vice versa. Let's first consider the motion from location A to location B. The height is decreasing, and the pendulum bob is increasing its speed. So we would say that the kinetic energy increases and the potential energy decreases. As the pendulum bob moves from B to C, it would be slowing down, but the height would be increasing. That would cause the kinetic energy to decrease and the potential energy to increase. Once at C, it turns around and heads back to B. This is a lowering of the height and an increasing of the speed. Because of that, the kinetic energy would increase and the potential energy would decrease. Finally, as the bob moves from location B back to location A to complete its cycle, it would be slowing down but gaining height. That means that the kinetic energy would decrease and the potential energy would increase. An energy bar chart is a conceptual tool that shows what form of energy the object possesses and how those forms change over the course of the object's motion. Above me you see an animation of a pendulum doing the back and forth and the corresponding energy bar charts for that pendulum. If you analyze the bar chart long enough, you'll observe the following patterns. First, as the pendulum bob moves towards the resting position, it's gaining speed but losing height. So the PE decreases and the kinetic energy is increasing. As the pendulum pendulum bob moves away from the resting position, it's gaining height but losing speed, so the potential energy is increasing and the kinetic energy is decreasing. Finally, you'll notice that the pendulum bob's total amount of energy, the sum of the kinetic and the potential, remains constant over the course of the motion. All of this, all of this presumes no damping effects of air resistance and other forces or dissipation of energy to the surroundings. Pendulum motion is an example of periodic motion. It always takes the pendulum bob the same amount of time to complete each consecutive cycle. The time to complete a full cycle of vibration is known as the period. A common physics lab involves determining what factors might affect the period of a pendulum. Usual independent variables include the length of the string, the mass of the bob, and the angle about which the pendulum bob swings. The results of such a study inevitably lead to the conclusion that the period of a pendulum depends only upon the length of the string. When done quantitatively, such a lab leads to the conclusion that the pendulum's period is proportional to the square root of the string length. This means that if we were to double the length of the string, we would cause the period to increase by the square root of 2. And if we were to triple the length of the string, the periods would increase by the square root of 3. And if we were to quadruple the length of the string, the periods would increase by a factor of the square root of 4, also known as 2. If we were to make the length smaller, we would cause the period to decrease as well. In fact, if we were to half the length of the string, we would cause the period to become smaller by a factor of the square root of 2. That is, the new value would be the original value for period divided by root of 2. The equation or formula for the period of a pendulum is t equal 2 times pi times the square root of the quantity L divided by g, where g is the acceleration of gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, can you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, leaving a question or comment in the comment section below. Now for your action plan. Here are three resources that you can find on our website. I've left links to each in the description section of this video. Any one of these could help make the learning stick. You have a tutorial page on the topic of pendulum motion. You have a concept builder section with three pretty awesome concept builders. And finally, our new calculator pad section has a problem set on period calculations. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H. Thanks for watching.